Hi, I'm Dave Barnes. And I'm John McLaughlin. And welcome to Dadville. Dadville is a podcast where we talk about life, love, and the pursuit of awesome dadding. It's funny thoughts and deep talks. So please, enjoy your time here in Dadville and enjoy this episode with... Brian Bates. So folks, we are here. Welcome back to Dadville. Um, This is a... This is a... uh, We're excited about this episode. We have... Local celebrity. <laughs> That's right. I'm Very sorry. local. You can take local out of it. Just celebrity. Just celebrity. No, just what celebrity. a backhanded compliment. <laughs> no. <laughs> very, very local celebrity. So you're crushing it regionally. <laughs> In the Donaldson Hermitage area, this guy kills. <laughs> Fat Bites, he'll be there <coughs> Thursday afternoon, 3.30. But it's Fat Bites with a Y so that it's a computer. It's like a computer internet cafe and a restaurant. <laughs> Fat Bites, coming in for Computer Bites. And, uh, you guys, by the way, do you know you're supposed to build a podcast? I look at your – you had Matthew McConaughey, Ted Danson. It's just – you're supposed to go the other way. Now you have no, me. No. Listen, no, listen. We've been climbing we the have summit a, We have a huge time. Donaldson listenership. <laughs> All right. They have just been okay. pounding We, we wanted to start globally and then get <laughs> – Famous well, local. you're doing a good job of <laughs> yeah. it because yeah. now you've got it's down a zip code fame, which I know very well myself. <laughs> uh, People in my neighborhood don't know me. So. Yeah, well, yeah, well, listen. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we we we, we uh, John and I have that affliction sometimes too, where you walk in and feel like, hey, we go, and everybody's like, no, no, no yeah, no, nothing. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you guys yeah. are so brave. <laughs> you're doing such a great job. I mean, it really like feels you like you don't know who I am. Yeah. <laughs> there was like for years, um, the only place I knew. That if I went in, somebody was going to want to talk, like, w- would spot me. And it was like when Your I had house. a really bad day, I would know if I went to the Apple Store in Green Hills, somebody was going to go, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh. Especially if you tweeted a couple hours yeah. before. <laughs> I'm <him>. coming to Green Hills. <laughs> <laughs> and it was usually my mom. This yeah. doesn't matter. Um, but it was like, it was so sad because if I was having a bad day, I just knew, like, there was at least one place I could go where somebody would be like, Are you still doing music? And it, that would take a different. <laughs> it could backfire. It could backfire. Um, okay, so, Brian, we, we're excited about having you. We were talking about this before we started recording. Um, we've known about you and your comedy for a while. Okay. Um, and then, gosh, probably, was it a couple months ago we were hanging with Annie Downs, mm-hmm. and she started laughing trying to recount a joke you had told, which is like always, that's tricky business yeah. when you're trying yeah. to do the, yeah. you know, the devil, whatever, of a joke that's from a stand-up comic, because it's, it's just, you can't win. Because yeah. even if you get it right, you know, you're just not going to really get it right. But she's like, guys, one, you got to have Brian on, but two, you had just had a baby, which officially qualifies you. All right. To be on. That's the yeah. reason I did it. That's what. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you were like, I'm so many I reached cool. out to my manager. Give me on Dadville. They're like, you got to have I a need baby. To do? I'll do anything. I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> I'll do it. Oh, actually, let me get married. Okay, so we got to go backwards. Let's yeah. find the girl. All this is just for this moment. <laughs> it's just paid off. Moment. Here you are. Well, you are being so, I appreciate how you're keeping it all in. Yeah. You really are. You're, you're containing your excitement. So well. <laughs> no, and so Annie told us, and we were like, this, this, we got to we got to make it happen. So we do a little bit of the of the who's who the brag sheet, and here's yours. Buckle up, okay, co-host. Because some of you, some people listening right now are like, "Why is this voice so familiar?" I did, do, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, you're the co-host along with Aaron Weber and Dusty Slay. I mean, it's, this is such a funny podcast of Nate Bargatze's Nate Lamb podcast, which you really run. I mean, you're you're sort I of the, you're, the, you're the functioning that. adult. I am. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I feel like every time I've listened, you are kind of. You can feel the sheep hurting. I'm the guy uh-huh. who keeps it all and going and, yeah, on the tracks. On the yeah. track, yeah. And I yeah. can't imagine doing that, <laughs> being a comic. Because yeah. it's not like you're, you know, you're not like the pro guy. They come in and you're like, okay, I'm going to be like the, you know, the, the serious one who's like, you're a comic too. So you're having to have a lot of discipline. It is. And I worry that no one even knows I'm a comic. <laughs> they, just think, <laughs> they think you're like, he's <laughs> just the guy who. <laughs> Get, lay some rules and yeah, make yeah, some get yeah, back on track. Yeah, yeah, which will help in parenting. FYI, um, uh, also appeared, which you talked about on two episodes of the show Sprung, which yep. is cool. So you're officially a TV star. Yep. Uh, latest stand up special, which is great, is uber important. Uh, appeared on the Gr- Grand Ole Opry and Sirius Radio, and finally, which we really want to highlight, <laughs> I love this. After a ten year vetting period, he was recently accepted into the singles. In the Church of Christ Facebook group, which <laughs> this got me so good. And, and just a little too late, sadly, we found with your life, you know. Not really. I mean. <laughs> you never know. You never know. You like to keep your options open, right? 
I didn't turn it down. I accepted. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Especially when it comes to the Church of Christ. Oh, oh yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I really did. I was laughing thinking about it. Like, you, you could just you could probably host this podcast just guesting better than we can hosting <laughs> you because you're so used to handling so many weird personalities at one time. <laughs> We were talking about this earlier, John and I. Well, why don't you ask John? This was John's. This was his. This was his. I am so fascinated with comedians. Okay. I mean, I think humor. <laughs> what a great response. Okay, I'm okay. listening. <laughs> I think humor is such a. Uh, it's just such a commodity. It's such a like universal kind of language. I don't know. I'm really fascinated with people who are funny. And obviously, I do this podcast with Dave, and Dave mm-hmm. is a comedian. Mm-hmm. And uh, and Light. we've had several Diet. comedians on, and it's just so uh, to me. There's so many things that are fascinating about it, and that we'll get to. But I always am interested in people's upbringings and their and their like the house they grew up in, the relationship with their parents, siblings, whatever, all that kind of stuff. But for some reason, especially with comedians, yeah, I'm really fascinated by that because. Something along the line, not to get into the nature nurture thing, but something along oh, the boy, line here we go. made you, you want to know funny. about my childhood trauma. Yes. Well, <laughs> and sometimes it, it doesn't come from that, but often it does. But it's there's always something interesting with everyone, but right. especially comedians. So I want to go. I want to go back to the beginning. Like, let's talk about like, where, did you grow up in Nashville? Just said, outside of Nashville, yeah. What part? Lebanon. Oh, Lebanon. nice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And what was the what was the childhood like? You, I mean, we've got three or four hours for you to kind of unpack it. Do you have but. any Kleenexes? Yeah, and if you want to go to grandparents, like we want to do numerous generations <laughs> back to start. Listen, let's do that. Let's do that. My people came from the old country in yep. the 1600s. Okay, okay. <laughs> With hope in their eyes yeah, and a dream yeah. deferred. No, I grew up, I mean, it was a, a pretty happy childhood. I, My parents were together, and I have one older sister. And what I guess I could say is, I always leaned on comedy. My dad really pushed me into doing sports, and I yeah. love sports, but I was really bad at sports. And I What were the sports that your dad wanted you to do? Mainly baseball. Yeah. And I shared a story. I shared it sometime on stage. I told it on the podcast about um, one time I – this is like in Little League. I stole second base, but I got there so easily and had such lack of confidence that in my mind I thought, oh, the batter must have fouled it off. So I turned around and started running back to first base. Uh-huh. And then halfway there, the they realized what's going on. And the, the first baseman's like, he's coming back. <laughs> and now I realize Why what's going on. Why would he come up. back? Yeah, so now We've I have to run full speed. <laughs> I have to slide head first into first base. There's oh dust. The ump has to call safe, all that. And so you stole the base that you already had. I stole two bases. I stole <laughs> yeah. second, and then I came back and stole first. The and gained nothing. The parent doing the scorebook had no idea how to score <laughs> he's that. Like, yeah, he's erasing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was bad at really bad at sports, and I and you know I think I just started developing the humor to try to offset it, just try to you know to, yeah to do that, and um, so there was no like childhood drama. Although I will say this. Um, I didn't get into comedy till very late in life. I was 35 that's when I started. That's insane. That is insane. And uh, so there is something. My dad passed away in December of 2006. I took a stand-up comedy class in January 2007. Oh, wow. Just for fun, just to get my mind off it and just something different to do. And mm-hmm. I really thought it was going to be a four-week course just for fun. And <laughs> here we are almost 16 years later, and this is what I'm doing. So what made you take that class? I mean, I think I was, well, you, let me back up even more. At my dad's funeral, I got up and spoke and I shared funny stories and people laughed and I realized that y- you can bring humor even in the toughest of mm. times and, 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 you know, help people comfort them. I was comforting myself, but I was also comforting my family and, and our friends. Yeah. And I shared funny stories about my dad and I saw the power of it. And then I also wanted to take this class just again, just to, Something different in my life. Just to, I always enjoy comedy, but I never really thought of it as a career. So, a couple questions with that. Do you do you think uh, your dad would be surprised by that, or would he be like, "No, that makes sense." I think he'd be surprised actually, mm-hmm. because I was a pretty quiet kid. Uh, most stand-up comedians are not the wild ones, you know. They're mostly right. introverts, and yeah. I showed that side of me around my friends. I was funny around my friends, and they all thought I was funny, but not really around my family that much. I was kind of, I kind of 
kept that in. So I think you'd be surprised, actually. That's amazing. You just made a really fascinating point, and I've, I've never thought about this, and I'm not trying to deem you the expert on this, but I would love to know your opinion. So if if if, if comics, for the most part, are introverted yeah. but funny, yeah. what – what are all the people that are extroverted and funny? Where are they? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, if it, where, where do you think, because I think you're really right. Like, of, of the people that I've met that do, do professionally, they're not, like, the guy at the party who's right. posted up in the corner and everybody's laughing. Yeah. And then and then they're also, they're definitely not the guy that has the same energy in just a normal conversation. Right. You know what I mean? It's like, they do tend to kind of know how to use it, and, and they're always watching and kind of taking notes. And then the stage is where they – Brian Regan's quote about this I think is so fascinating. But he talks about like – you know, he can, he's like – you know, a lot of people ask me, like, you're, you're so kind and sort of quiet in person. And he said, well, because I can't control that. <laughs> he's like, I can control yeah, the yeah, stage. Yeah. It's my agenda. That's it's right. Like what I want to do. And I thought that was such a great – because I'm, I'm a pretty extreme extrovert. And so I do think – it's like I wonder if that's the path a lot of – that personality type is it like where do those do they, do they become like preachers and you know like <laughs> actors i just wonder i mean i don't even know well there is answer. that that old saying about like comedians say funny things and comedic actors say things funny mm. have you heard mm-hmm. that that's you know great. What I mean? Yeah, mm-hmm. I wonder if there's some kind of yeah. parallel there. Maybe they go more into improv. Yeah, that's a yeah. That's, yeah. that's what I wanted to know. Yeah, I was I could see that, um, and that that's true. But Brian Regan, I think I've tried to be funny in certain settings like this and it doesn't always work out because <laughs> right there's now. too many external you know stimulus and and i'm not saying you i was just joking about that but you know you're at a party yeah, or something you're yeah. trying to share people interject their own stuff and you're like no 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 just let me finish <laughs> i got this i got i need a beat of space here yeah yeah for the yeah joke to land don't yeah. you be chiming in with stuff you're, <laughs> yeah. you're ruining my timing <laughs> yeah so i finally like fine i'll just make a career of it so i can have the stage myself yeah it's so it but that is so it's so fascinating it it really is sort of a trope like a well-worn out trope but i think it's so true like the more i've met people who are in that space they really do tend to be more introverted kind of quiet yeah you know they're just not the thing you would assume the first thing is somebody gets on stage you're like you have to be the most confident you know big personality because you're in front of thousands of people and you're doing whatever the night is it could be 200 which is maybe more terrifying to me yeah, yeah, than yeah. a thousand yes yeah. but I you feel know that way too either way you're in front of a lot of people i mean it's a seinfeld joke like you know the whole but i'd rather die than be on you know to have to speak in front of people it's that uh-huh. whole thing right but it is so interesting that so many people still do it like there's something inside of you that was like no i'm gonna do that i know and it was terrifying and it's amazing how as soon as I walk off stage and meet the people that I was just performing in front of, I get, the confidence goes away. <laughs> I get quiet. I don't know how to talk to them. And I hear com- comics talk about how, oh, yeah, it was a great way to meet girls. Not for me. Yeah. Because as soon as I got off yeah. stage, I was just back to old whatever myself, you know. I was uh, – this is not really what we're talking about, but just this weekend I was on the road with Leanne Morgan. We were at an airport, and we were getting ready to board. And this woman comes running up, and she's very excited to see Leanne. And she's like, oh, my gosh, Leanne Morgan, whatever. It, we're on Delta. So Delta, what's the first th- I guess it would be um, first class. They call yeah. it, you know, first class or whatever. And Leanne. We know how frequent you use it by, by your reference there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what exactly. is the place? Well, that's, you're getting to my point. Am I pronouncing that right? First. So, so Leanne uh, she walks on. So now I'm stuck here with this lady. And she's like, I'm sorry. That was a, just a famous comedian I was talking to. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a comedian, too. And she was like, oh, really? What do you do? But then we have to sit there, and Delta has like 12 levels oh, of, be- of beating you down. <laughs> There's priority, this. There, I mean, you know, it's just it's a class system. Overachiever. <laughs> yeah. Average achiever. Leanne's been gone for like six, cl- you know. <laughs> and now finally this woman has to go board herself, and I'm still just standing there. <laughs> she leaves. In main group 12. <laughs> They're like we'll take all the last child, all every last child, the youngest <laughs> sibling. Now you're boarding. I know, and then so I have funny. to get on the plane and walk past this woman uh. who was just talking. It's just comedy or any entertainment. It'll humble you as soon as you think I got this. Right, it'll humble you. The thing that, that I know we've joked about, and everybody that does what John and I do have joked about this. Like, there's nothing more humbling than when you when you don't have to deal with this thankfully as much because you don't carry your piano around. But there's always a cue for a conversation when you have a guitar on your back mm-hmm. where you're carrying one. Mm-hmm. You know, you bump, oh, yeah. you bump into the guy that, hey, uh, you, you in a band or something? You in a band or something? And then the next question, which is like the 
there's no nobody wins the guy asking or the girl asking and then you would would I know who you are uh-huh. and I'm like would just think it's about such a what, great question though it's just, it's like metaphysical <laughs> would I almost. know it's like would I <laughs> like it's almost like your brain sort of fillets in half hearing it because you're like I don't even know what the tense is or what the subject is I know. would if I know. you did but but it but it's terrible because then I have <laughs> to answer. do you would if you did and that's just a walk off <laughs> yeah but like but it's to your point I, then I have to go uh and I'm like, how do we want to do this? Do I yeah, really it is engage? weird because it's like you have to be, you have to tell someone, well, some people know who I am and they, they would be these people if you've heard of this. <laughs> but then you also want to be humble. But it's yeah. like, but the, the situation is already humiliating. Oh, so God. do I need to be humble? Yeah, you guys can't hide it if you have an instrument no. with you. I usually can and I try all costs to avoid it. I just... Right before I came here, I got my hair cut. I know you guys are like, wow. It looks but, amazing. But, really uh, good. The, the pink streak in the middle. <laughs> I saw you in your car kind of doing it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. But the guy cutting my hair was like, and I'm sure you guys go through this all the time, you don't really want to get in what you do. Oh, yeah. He's like, uh-huh. are you off today from work? And I was like, yep, I'm off today. And then, you know, I, I'm trying to decide, am I going to have to tell this guy what I do? Because he keeps asking more questions. He's like, um, are you off for the holidays? And... You know, he just and I really don't want to have to get into it because then that leads to so many other things. And I was in there, and I'd been there for a while. And then one of the other guys who knows me walked in. He's like, "Hey, how's comedy going? Oh, how's whatever?" Man. And then I felt embarrassed because the guy's been cutting my hair, and I feel like I've been hiding the secret from him. Uh-huh. But then they always ask, "Tell me a joke." There you go. Yeah. And it, I just have to. Like, it really doesn't work that way. Yeah. It just doesn't. It's that 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 is, and that's also. I mean, listen. When we had Nate on, this is one of the first things that we talked about, was how, with musicians, you don't ask anyone to sing. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't, or you don't go, hey, pull your guitar and play. I mean, like you'll you'll get on Southwest Flight and say, oh, you want to play something for us? And I was like, mm-hmm. no, okay. And then you sit down. Yeah. But yeah. nobody's signif- or nobody's seriously asking you to right. to be like, hey, we'll play something. You know, comedy. You know, it, the first thing they're going to do is like, well, come on, tell like. Give it what you got. Yeah, because you're just sitting here and all you got to do is talk, right? So, what's your response to that? Do you just say like, ah, oh, it just doesn't work that way? I mean, yeah, I hate to say it like that, but I mean, if I try to tell you a joke, it's not going to work well. Yeah, it's going to bomb. <laughs> and yeah, I, and I have, I used to have a joke about this: how we have the one profession, everyone's done that, everyone's made their friends laugh, so everyone's kind of judging us, thinking, oh, I could do that too. Yeah, yeah. Right. Because I don't know how to play an instrument. And there's no way if I'm watching you guys, I'm like, oh, I could do that. I can't. Or a magician doing tricks. You don't right. have me. But we've all made our friends laugh. So we're all like, mm. oh, I can do that. Um, so, but it just doesn't work that way. Well, and the other thing that, that I that I think I have so much respect for y'all that do it. Um, we, You know, so like this is what I, this is the example I use. Like if Sting walked into a club in New York, mm-hmm. right? And the, the show's done and they're like, hey, we have, Sting is in the, in the house tonight he wants to play a couple new songs <laughs> everybody's gonna be like we're sitting down have sting play songs they can be terrible like it can be some of the worst music music you've ever heard but there's always something inherently redemptive about the experience because he's there mm-hmm. and you hear the timbre of his voice even if you don't like the song mm-hmm. and he's playing guitar and the overall effect of it is still gonna be like those were not great but god that was sting so it's still a win for sting mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like the cumul- the cumulative takeaway is that that was sting and he played new songs yeah. right i mean if you learn anything from that comedian yep. movie and you're watching just, seinfeld thinking that too. build it back when they have yeah. he's down at caroline's seinfeld's here and he comes out and he just bombs and it's not just that he bombs it's that the expectations there's so many things that are happening in that moment. It's yeah. not just that Seinfeld. It's like you better be funny. When you're not funny, it is a hundred thousand times worse of a disappointment than a song that's bad. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so there's nowhere to go. He can't like you know if, if again Sting and he's like a guitar solo. Sorry guys, like Sting, we love you. Thanks for doing. You and know, the and then fame, he off. the fact that it's Jerry Seinfeld buys Makes him it, a little yeah. bit of time. He and says I forget that. what it is like. 30 seconds or buys you two minutes or whatever? Yeah, he says that. And he says Jack Nicholson's the example he uses. If Jack Nicholson walked in here, even he, at first everybody would be crazy. And then after a few minutes, they'd be like, all right, Jack, you got to make us laugh. Yeah. If that's what you're supposed yeah. to do. Yeah, yeah. But with music, yeah. and, and when I started, I was so bad, like we all are, and some of us still are. And <laughs> your friends would come out, or you go to these open mics, and if you play guitar and you're bad, you just have to sit there passively, and then you can clap at the end. Yeah. But for comedy, it's an interactive thing. Yeah. You have to laugh. You cannot yeah. fake laughter very well, long. And, right. 
And we get to put off that judgment for three, three and a half minutes. Yeah. You have seven seconds sometimes. Yeah. You but got I will bit say, here's the, my thing with being on stage, being a musician, is I, I just personally, I don't think this is every musician, but I, I have to have, I feel like the show starts for me once I make them laugh. Mm. Like, but I, and I don't feel like I am a comedian. I'm not trying mm-hmm. to be a comedian, but because I could play this whole show and it could be sort of this performative on both sides mm-hmm. thing where it's like, I'm going to play the songs. You guys are obviously going to clap mm-hmm. because that's just, that's what happens. Mm-hmm. But I don't have any gauge on how is this going until I make them laugh. And then I feel like I connected with them and then I can kind of like, it's like me making the basket in the, in the basketball game like i've made my shot okay now i can relax and i can play (laughs) right (laughs) you you just so much showed your hand for your i made the basket like every white man above 80 just went (laughs) absolutely and everybody else was like he's making is he making (laughs) baskets what is i mean that was just such a wonderful (laughs) i noticed that musicians of a certain age my age and older they have a go-to joke when i go see them they do the joke where they'll say, and maybe there's some truth to it, but I think they just all say it. Some girl came up and asked people for an autograph or, or something, and she said, my mom is such a big fan of yours. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I've seen so many artists use that joke on stage, and it works, and it's, but it's funny, but, you know, I think it's just a kind of go-to thing. Oh, uh-huh. well, it's, I mean, John, we talk about this so much, John and I, like, you know, just when we are catching up, how shows went. And, and, and again, John's right. It's like, for he and I both, one of the quickest – barometers is like are they laughing H- how quickly are they in and then everything just calm like you feel the show relax mm-hmm. but but you know those nights where i'm like five shows in and they're still fighting me on not the songs like the the band can be killing it or whatever mm-hmm. we're uh, it's not about our point it's just like the connection's not there yeah and you just fight and i tell you too and, and i know you know this from the shows you've been doing like venues uh, uh, you know it's another thing that fascinates me about what you do but venues really matter I mean, like, it, they matter to the musicians, vibe of the too. Room. They, they yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know, you're time. playing, and it's either takes longer to hear it back from the, you know, singing and all the things and seeing people. But, man, I feel like comedy, you know, 100 people to 1,000 is, like, monumentally different, you know? Yeah. I mean, I would – 100 I'd probably be okay with unless the room was really big. But, mm-hmm. you know, 30 or, or even less, that's going to scare me much more than 3,000. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because at least as a huge crowd, you know somebody's going to laugh. <laughs> Thirty, or f- maybe no one will laugh. Maybe nobody laughs. <laughs> and right. the room is set. Of, I just did a show. You're from Anderson, Indiana. Uh-huh. I did a church in Anderson, Indiana. Gosh, that's been almost a year because it was a Christmas party last last Christmas, and they said um, we take an intermission halfway through the set, and I'm like, do my comedy set? Because for comedy, that's just not good. Oh, that's oh bad. yeah. And oh. they were like, yeah. And I said, well, that's not, you know, comedy, you build momentum and you get people going and it's not good to take in. And, and I, I rarely push back on anything, but um, I said, well, how, how would your pastor like it if halfway through a sermon, you know, right. he has to stop and take a 15 minute punch break or whatever and mm-hmm. then come back. But they were insisting on this. And finally I was like, okay. <laughs> and I did it and it did not go well. And then we have to take an intermission, and I have to go back and set. Usually, at least when the show's bad, you can just get your check and get out of yeah, there. Yeah, let's right. leave. Right. I had to go back and sit at a round table oh. with the pastor and his family oh. for 15 minutes while everyone goes through line and gets their punch or bathroom or whatever. Right. And that was just the worst because I have to sit in my misery and think, <laughs> I got to get back up there and do the do second half. More. So when you're sitting there, are you thinking, okay, I got to change up? The, the second half of the show, I got to do something different. I got to, what am, I, do you have like some go to? Or you just lean in. <laughs> yeah. Or do you just lean into the bomb? There's, there's not a ton at that moment I could do. I mean, <laughs> I don't it's have kind of such a funny. repertoire where I can like totally change it up, but I was kind of going over my notes thinking about, all right, what jokes am I going to do the second half? And, and, uh, you know, I didn't, <laughs> just like, I just got to ride this thing out and, and yeah. do the best did, I can. Did, did you break them at all? Did it ever happen? It got better. It got better. Um, yeah, I feel like, because, I, you know, most comedians, they do their best stuff off the top, which did not work, and then they save their other best stuff for the end. And yeah, you so kind of I, I mean, it. I feel like the second half was better, but it was tough. And taking a intermission during a comedy set, 
in the middle of that. Oh. It's not good. Yeah. All the momentum, any momentum I had built was gone. Right. It, it is venue, venues. They matter for music, but they, I mean, and I mean literally just yeah. where you're standing in the world to do comedy yeah. because like, you know, I saw where a bunch of people were doing, I think even, uh, Angela said she did this where, or who, oh no, 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 Dustin Nickerson uh-huh. did like these COVID oh, yeah. back, whatever oh, yeah, yard yeah, yeah. things. And I was like, that just feels like a nightmare. That that would be like doing comedy on a zoom or something. Like yeah. That. Where you just can't. Yeah, you're, you there's don't no, get any... there's, there's no housing of it. There's just Justin kind of... did one where there was a swimming pool. It was outside a swimming pool in between him and the audience. <sighs> <laughs> That's just like torture to me. I mean, it just feels like torture. So okay, so something that is so unique about your story, which you just said, is that you started when you're 35. Yeah. What, what like. Was there a moment that you went, okay, this is hard. I don't want to do this anymore. And you're like three years in five, you know, w- or, or was it cause, cause it's such a different thing being that age. Cause you're, you're older, you're wiser, right. you've got some more acumen about right. you. You kind of yeah, know you how don't money have works. That kind of, like there are things that I did when I was 20 that I, I don't, I wouldn't do now, but I was, I didn't know any better. Yeah. That's right. You and don't kind of gave me that courage. Yeah. And you haven't things. built up sort of like. Uh, momentum in your life right. you know you're there's you're probably right. used to having a certain budget and doing th- things or owning a pl- whatever you've got that you're you know and you're just kind of restarting yeah so most comics you know start in their early 20s some start mm-hmm. in their teens but most start most of the comedians i know started right after college mm-hmm. or even before college so by the time they're 35 they're well established in my whole career up until really recently i've always thought what if what if if only i started when I was in my 20s, where I could be now and stuff like yeah. that. But recently, I've come to the realization, I was just sharing this with someone this weekend, knowing me and knowing how hard the business is, I probably would have quit. Wow. Because it's really, really hard. And I think after a couple of years of just, you know, sleeping on my oh, friend's yeah. couch oh, yeah. or whatever mm-hmm. it is you got to do, I'd be like, I don't want to do this. Yeah. I went to college. I just, I want to do something for real. So in a way, God blessed me, maybe knew that was the only way I that was going to do it. That is fascinating. Because the time I started, I was already in a job that was making decent money, and I never had to suffer in that way as far yeah. as like sleeping in my car. These comics, they have these, you know, they sleep in their car all the time. I could always like, even if it wasn't a great paying gig, I could afford to get a hotel or something Because you had worked and you yeah, had money. Yeah, and I had money. Yeah, yeah. And then, and at that time I wasn't married, so... I just kind of saved up my money and did my own thing. And, and it's maybe in a way it was the only way I would have stuck with it. Isn't that, it, that's a great perspective on that. Yeah. Cause it's one of those, it is one of those few things where it may have in your situation buoyed you to do it. It benefited yeah. me probably. And you'd live, I'm assuming you'd live some life to go like, okay, that's cool. Yeah. But it's not doing it. Like the fire in my belly for this other thing is not there. Like, absolutely. You and know. what was the transition like from like, like how did you let go of the, the day job? Uh, the job, yeah. So I worked at a TV station here in Nashville right out of college. Just behind the scenes, producer, stuff like that, which helps me for the Nate Land podcast. Oh, yeah, yeah, because like you that, know that world, yeah. That world. And I was up to, like, middle management. Um, but the last – so when I started comedy, I kept my day job for eight years. This was not a oh quick wow. transition. Wow, yeah. And I would do my job during the day, and then I would go do shows either around town or sometimes out of town, you know, depending or whatever. And then – I finally got busier and busier, and I, I heeded everyone's advice. Everyone said, don't quit too soon. Everyone thinks they're ready, mm. and they think they're doing it. Don't quit until you absolutely have to. Wow. And then I finally got to the point where um, I'm like, I think I can do this. And for the last six months before I quit my job, I lived just off my comedy income. Just, just to, to see, make sure you could do it. Just to make sure I could do it, and I did it. And at that time, I was single, and I thought, you know what? If I if I starve, I'll only be hurting myself. Yeah. And um, so it wasn't a quick process. It was eight years of doing both and then built up where I quit my job. So do you remember, like I'm putting myself in your shoes and you, you're you at dinner parties and people are like, so what do you do? I'm a producer or mm-hmm, whatever you would mm-hmm, say. Mm-hmm. And then at some point you're like, okay, this is next time someone asks me, I'm going to say I'm a stand-up comedian. Was or did there, you just avoid that because you didn't want the guy going, well, hell then. Give me a- <laughs> yeah, 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 right. <laughs> well, that's a good point. At that moment, I probably wanted to tell people so badly right. that, that I 
and and then now it's it's funny how it's flipped because really I was it then, but I was uh-huh. you know I it was, was like getting... your second surname. Yeah, Brian exactly. makes comic. Good to <laughs> good to meet you. Yeah, it's funny because then you want everyone like I have a joke now where I I break down this song the devil went down to georgia <laughs> uh-huh. that just <laughs> makes you laugh already and the devil goes you know i guess you didn't know it but i'm a fiddle player too and i'm like that's so like a comedian because he wants everyone to know like my friends say hey you still driving for uber i'm like well i also do comedy <laughs> right. you know the devil's so insecure he's like hey i don't know, I don't know if you know this know this i just had, I had a lot of time with it yeah and i just get labeled no as the prince of demons my fiddle career. <laughs> but i took 12 right. years of violin lessons <laughs> So, <laughs> but the, immediately I started thinking like the devil's showing up, showing up to a violin lesson. Yeah, like completely serious about just it. Just waiting, and the guy's terrified. And he's like, "Please don't be scared. I just really can't get the A scale." He's like, "You know, I'll do anything." He's like, no, "All I want you to do is just show me how to do the fingering on the A scale." I'm so sorry. I'll serve you. Ever. I don't need you to serve me. Show me the A scale. I just can't. I'm trying to learn, you know. <laughs> that is amazing. Well, I mean, the song says he opened up his case and said, I'll start this show. I love just the thought the devil's carrying his case. <laughs> right. He's like, I took 12 years of violin lessons. I'm not letting TSA at Atlanta Airport <laughs> damage this thing. He shows up. Everybody's terrified. Yeah. You can just see me comes in. I'm the devil. They're like, I'm like, but hold on. What is. Oh, you, Oh, do you see the fiddle? <laughs> you guys, no, pick up a guitar. He's like, before, no, I'm not going to do anything bad yet. Just like, can we jam for a second? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> so, so, so I'm curious, kind of what John said, like, as you're saying, this is so interesting to me. When, when was that moment that you thought, okay, I've hit the, like, w- was there a marker where you went, okay, now I'm, I'm ready to quit my job because I hit these numbers or I, I'm playing to this many people every mm-hmm. night or I'm just booked this much. Like what, what was that marker that kind of, mm-hmm. because the thing is, and I say that because, you know, when you think with John and I who've done music since kind of like you're, like you were saying your friends, like just right out of college, right? there's no marker because there's nothing you need to hit. It's just, right. can I eat and mm-hmm. pay for rent? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you know, your life is so different because you have a job. You're older, you're a little bit older than, mm-hmm. than your contemporaries in some ways. Mm-hmm. Um, what were those things that you went, okay, I'm ready to give up this kind of stability. I know you know, because this is happening now. Um, I don't remember being, I just, again, I was single. So that helped me so much in the sense that I only hurting myself if I yeah, have yeah. to just really cut back. And I never lived like a lavish lifestyle. I was living in a, you know, one bedroom condo and, mm. and driving my Honda Accord. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I thought, I think I can do this. So it wasn't like it was one, like, Oh, look at the, it, it was just gradual build up. And I'll say one one thing is um, Nate Bargatze started taking me more on the road with him, and that really helped me out. And it was such a blessing because this wasn't even planned, but I quit my job in December of 2017. Mm. Nate moved back to Nashville January 2018. Wow. Hmm. Now, he moved back actually maybe even December, same month he moved back to Nashville. So that really just was a blessing because then we're in the same town and he was taking me out when he could on the road, but he was living in L.A. at that time, mm-hmm. and now he's back in Nashville, so now I could really start going on the road for him. So that was like a blessing. Wow. There were little things like that. Just, yeah, just um, kind of lined up. Yeah, there was never, it still hasn't been like one big, just like, oh, that changed everything. Yeah, went, yeah. yeah. It's a slow build. It's a slow build, but that's okay. Yeah. Did, what, what, I'm curious, like, how did, how did the station... How did they? Take oh, they it? probably knew that you. They knew you were doing it on the side. I'm sure. Oh but. yeah, and they were always really supportive, and and just like anything, I'm sure with you guys too. When you first start doing anything, all your friends come out, and then that quickly <laughs> trickles away. Right. It's understandable. Right. Yeah. They're like, all yeah. right, dude, I saw you. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's not a one time thing. Yeah, but they're still always supportive of me, and and um, I think they probably saw it coming. Yeah, because I was getting some pretty cool bookings. Yeah, you mm-hmm. know, um, I've been fortunate to i was doing the i did the ryman pretty early and yeah obviously not me headlining but, yeah, yeah you know just yeah, getting yeah. on the stage and stuff yeah. like that so That's, what what is the the difference to the extent that you can answer this between like some of those early gigs when you were walking on stage right again i just i cannot imagine as much as i do feel like humor is a part of my shows. Mm-hmm. I, I, I can get up there and I'm playing music mm-hmm. and then I can dabble. I can dip my toe in the humor thing whenever I want to. I can always retreat back mm-hmm. into music. <laughs> retreat you, is such a great word. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> when you are getting on that stage, it's just you and some things that you think are funny. Yeah. It blows my mind. So 
How would you describe the difference between some of those early gigs when they say your name, you walk up on stage versus your last couple gigs mm -hmm. and your mindset as you're walking on stage? How is it different now? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't ever remember being so nervous that I was like, oh my gosh, I can't do this. I'm about to be sick. But I was probably more nervous than I even realized. I definitely mm -hmm. remember being nervous. I remember standing backstage, either at open mic or Zanies would let you do three minutes occasionally and mm -hmm. just going over, going over, going over my set over and over and over like everyone does. And I remember those first few times, the very first time I did comedy was very close to here at Bongo Java over oh. by Belmont. There's was, that, a, was that your first time? That was my first time. Yeah. That upstairs room? Uh -huh. That's a great. Unbelievable. That's a great room. And I just remember I'm on, I'm on stage. I'm really just reciting. I'm not thinking. I'm just reciting my lines. Right. And I'm like, what's the next thing I have to say? I'm just trying to remember that. <laughs> and then um, I just remember then you get more and more comfortable and you actually start doing some thinking up there. Like, yeah. you know your jokes well enough that you can start thinking about some stuff. Or what if I did this? What if I did that? And now... I mean, it's probably even more amazing than I realized just how you go out there and like these, I was on the road with, with Leanne Morgan this weekend. She was doing 3000 seat theaters. Her crowds are so great. I really don't even worry about it because I know mm -hmm. they're going to be yeah, great. They're just great. But I'll go do, um, I got some corporate Christmas parties coming up that I am terrified mm, about because yeah. I'm not going to know until I walk in there what the setup's like. Yeah. And, um, I don't know if you guys have this ex experience, but, um, Often these corporates or even churches, they're some of the toughest gigs because everyone there knows each other very, very well. And then a stranger walks in and the vibe of the room changes. Mm -hmm. And then I'm get up there and I'm not a great corporate comedian because in the sense that I don't talk about, boy, traffic here is really bad. And I don't talk about a lot of universal stuff like what's the deal with whatever. <laughs> uh, most of my comedy is about me yeah, yeah, and my wife and my kid and whatever. And I'm like, why would they care? This is uh -huh. just a bunch of strangers that on their lunch break, you know, when we're in the right. cafeteria or whatever, why would they care about me and my wife? And so, I mean, I think to me, that's why if you're using your hands that much, it can't be considered Kung Fu, like classic Kung Fu. Wait, am, John, am I still supposed to be hypnotized? Shoot, or can wow. I feel? Anyway, we'll, okay. we'll, we'll pick that up later. Well, that was a long story. Yeah. Uh, okay, John, how is the episode going for you so far? How do you feel? Uh, yeah, I mean, Brian is hilarious and all, he but is. I, I feel like I could have done better asking that third question. Yeah, that's keep exactly going. what halftime's for, John. Still yep. break. You look at how you can improve and make adjustments. And mm -hmm. don't worry, you'll be much better in the second half. But right now, we need to tell everyone about Haya Health. Oh, Haya Health, that's right. And I was just thinking about how I could get my kids to enjoy taking their vitamins. Yeah. You know, Typically, children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. Yep. We all know this. Yep. Filled with two teaspoons of Eesh. sugar, unhealthy chemicals, and other gummy junk growing kids should never eat. Preach. I mean, preach, Johnny. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. why Haya was created. Yep. The pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin. Quick question. Yep. What's your favorite vitamin or mineral? Uh, I'm kind of a vitamin C guy okay, myself. You know, okay. But I never turned down a little bit of B12. Yeah, that's what they yeah. say. Yeah. And when I gave these to my kids... They couldn't believe how great they tasted. Oh. It was as if I was giving them keys to their health. Dave. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full body nourishment our kids need with the yummy taste they love. It's non GMO, vegan, dairy free, allergy free, gelatin free, nut free, and everything else you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Plus, it can be delivered straight to your door, so you don't even have to remember to head to the store. Okay. And that rhymed, Dave. <laughs> Listen, that's, you're, you're a professional at, yeah. at this point. How uh, are you feeling at this point at halftime? At halftime, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the ice bath that you made for me is mm -hmm. really kind of working. I love that you've started to do that. But mm -hmm. yeah, I'm ready for the rest of the pod. Okay, I okay. let's keep going. Just wait until you hear about this deal, though, that Haya is going to give our listeners. Then we're back in the episode. Can't wait. Yeah. Also... Haya is formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Dave. Yep. Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies. Then, after that, mm -hmm. supercharged Ooh. with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, yep. B12, yep. C, mm -hmm. zinc, folate, mm -hmm. and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. Mm. All your favorites in one easy-to-chew vitamin. Okay, here's the deal. 
me. I'm Tell sweating him. with excitement. Yeah. And I'm in an ice bath. Which you, is, so that's really <laughs> impressive. Listen, if you head to HayaHealth.com slash Dadville, you will get 50% off your first I don't order. believe it. Yep. I don't believe yep. it. Yep. 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 And this deal is not available on the regular website. So you got to head to HayaHealth.com slash Dadville to get 50% off your first order and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. I, I did, um, so I've done, you know, over the years, I don't know, I've probably done 25 stand-up shows, like, over my whole career. And um, a couple years ago, uh, a friend of mine, and so I put out this comedy album, and I had, you know, all your friends on. We we talked about, like I told you, those, yeah. you know, Leanne and Angela, everybody. Um, How, where did you practice it? It just shows, my my music shows. You would just incorporate the jokes yeah, as well? Yeah, it'd just be, like, little bits. Okay, you know, I mean, Dave's, like Dave's concerts are half stand up. Yeah, I mean it's it's sort of they devolved into that these that, days. Yeah. But but it got but basically my manager came to me like, you know, five years in my career was like, We gotta do it stand up night. Like really? it's it's just it's time. And I was like, Okay. So what I did, which you'll appreciate this, he calls me and he goes, Okay, I'm gonna book um I'm gonna book he said, When do you want to do the stand up thing? And I was like, All right, here's the couple of rules that I have. Um, let's do it at Bongo Java upstairs. I invite everybody personally. Okay. So I need just my friends. All, right. All of my safest friends will do two shows of 50 people of my friends. Okay. Two nights in a row. Don't tell me when you book them because I will get out of them. And he was like, <laughs> you seriously? Like, yeah, do, like make it where I can't get out or I will weasel my way out of these because it's terrifying. Yeah. So, so exactly what happened. He called me. He's like, hey, you know, July, whatever. And, you know, it was two nights. And I was like, oh, dude. And he's like, brother booked. And I was like, mm. <laughs> Please don't make me do this. <laughs> so, so I do them, um, and it was so interesting because, you know, I didn't have. Were a, you there? I wasn't. This was before we moved this here. This was a okay. long, long time. Yeah, it was a okay. long time ago. And, um, but it was kind of one of those things where I pulled my friend. I mean, these are my yeah. good friends. Like, these are people I'd known a long time. Yeah. And I just was kind of like, all right. Kind of like over the next couple of weeks, I'd see him or text him or email. Uh-huh. And everybody kind of said the same thing. Like, man, it was it was like a lot of potential and mostly funny. Yeah. And they said, like, there's something there if you yeah. want to develop it. And so, but I say all that to say this. The thing that, that is so interesting to your point about, like, rooms and responses, there's nothing more terrifying in my life. Marriage, having our kids, anything that would sort of give you that sort of terror, you know, mm-hmm. shows. I mean, just big shows, like whatever, mm-hmm. headline the rhyme or whatever. Nothing was as scary. So we did those shows. And then this and this is a problem with – this is my parents gave this to me. We have just a lot of unfounded confidence. It's just like ridiculously unfounded confidence. <laughs> and one of my dad – my dad always says the Barnes family motto is we, we may not know but we're sure about it. Yeah. And that's a very – that is a very true thing to me. So for whatever reason, my logic was let's just book, you know, uh, the bell court and I'll just do a full night. Yeah. That was the next step. <laughs> from two fifty person only your friends. Yeah. And so we booked it. The five minutes before walking on that stage, one of my managers came downstairs and she literally turned the corner and she was like, Oh my God, are you okay? I was blanche white. Like <laughs> shaking, thinking, What have I done? Yeah. You know. But but it's so weird because the thing that, that is so different from what we do, and John and I've talked about this, that you guys are so good at, is pace to John's point, like all you've got is you and you're funny. Mm-hmm. And I did one of these corporate things. So like I'd done all those and I got pretty good at it. I got to where I was doing, you know, like I could do about an hour. I, I, my problem is I can go too long. Mm-hmm. I'm the guy that will just keep going. And so like my wife and manager would come to shows and they were like, you got to shut this thing down. Yeah. Man. You're like 30 minutes over. Like oh, wow. 45 minutes instead of an hour 15. And I was like, but I could just chat it up. And they were like, no. So yeah, I got a pretty tight 45 to an hour after all these years of doing it. And, uh, and so a friend of mine, you know, was like, hey, will you come do this corporate thing but stand up? Yeah. And I was like, sure, why not? I'm telling you, it was – it. I've never <laughs> I've never done anything like that because it was like – it was at, it was at Opry Land. Okay. It's this huge room. Ball, like a ballroom? Ballroom. Yeah. Cut off in half, thank yeah. God. Yeah. Black out there, so I can't really see anybody, yeah. thank God. It's all doctors and, and nurses. Okay. And they're, they're like glad to be there. And I'm thinking, this is going to go great in about – a minute in, you feel the pulse of like, oh, we are not together. And you're just doing stand-up. Just doing stand-up. So you can't grab your guitar and say, And yeah. so all, I'm, all <laughs> I could do was just, I got to lean in yeah, and just pray to God. Because I couldn't hear him laugh. I was like. And how much time were you doing? 45 minutes. Oh, gosh. And so I just was like, here we go. And I mean, I'm like. so A minute in, you feel that. You have 44 oh, more minutes I, it, to go. It's, it's. 
and the so the good thing was so I really thought I am bombing. Every and it was just expounding on itself. It was yeah, like yeah. it was just like an algorithm that was building. It wasn't like it's getting better. And uh-huh. and I'm really like, you know, I'd performed enough. Like this was a couple of years ago. Like I'm I know how to perform. So mm-hmm. I'm like just lean into it. And I'm mm-hmm. like, do not show weakness. Yeah. You think this is funny? Dang it. Mm-hmm. And I keep going. But the whole time, I mean, my back is just sweat. It yeah. is just. And I'm all right. And they all right. And every now and then I laugh. And then of course, to your point, I did a bit on doctors that killed because uh. they were like. That's what we do, you know. Yeah. But then I get back to the normal set. It was kind of like, so anyway, I get done with the set and I walk down. I mean, I, it's a really good friend of mine who had booked it. And I was like, I literally said, I am so sorry. And she's like, what are you talking about? And I was like, you know, I've done this. I just haven't done that. I, I'm, and she was like, Dave, it was great. I was laughing. Could you not hear him? And I just couldn't hear him. Mm. And it was awful. It was awful. Because it was like numerous people, like 15 people. Like, yeah, that's great. And I was like, yeah. Oh, it was, well. I mean, I, I was just sweating. I couldn't. But rooms in what you do, again, they, like in, yeah. so on this tour I did, uh, I did half stand-up, half songs. And we did the biggest room we did with this Ryman. And it was crazy. It was one of my favorite things about doing that, that show because I would do 45 minutes of music, 15-minute intermission, and then 45 minutes of stand-up. Yeah. Pacing at the Ryman. Because I was doing mostly four to five hundred, you right. know, even gosh, a couple two hundred person shows like right. Northwest, like time, those were a blast doing stand up. Like when you get in a little two and everybody's having a good time, uh-huh. those are so much fun because uh-huh. the energy is so palpable. Yeah. But the rhyming was so fascinating because like you know I, I was used to going boom one two new joke yeah, new, new, you know, and there it was like people are laughing and you know it's 2,000 people it rolls too it rolls Mm -hmm. yeah and so Mm -hmm. for you it's got to be such an interesting thing depending on the night Mm -hmm. you're out with Leanne and you're going I mean I would imagine you're probably cutting your stuff out because people just laugh for so long absolutely happened this weekend and we we had a guy on the show who did a guest set and he told me afterwards he's like I'm not used to those big rooms with the laughs so i was stepping on my laughs yes I was, mm-hmm. I was talking and people were still laughing so it's the whole thing about getting your timing down well you know what i was so impressed with i laughed so hard i, I was i was like creeping on you earlier with uh, instagram that bit it this is where you show your professionality i'm not kidding i think this is where <laughs> comics know what they're doing <laughs> when you're doing <laughs> you're doing the bit about <laughs> i'm still in your wild oats <laughs> Oh, that's a really old joke. Well, but it's amazing because I see your brain. Yeah. Like, and you would too, John. Like, as a performer, I see exactly what your brain is doing because the guy yells, you just need yeah. a bigger tractor, <laughs> which is amazing. Yeah. And I can see you go, not yet. People are laughing. And you're like, yeah. not yet. I can see you going, wait, wait for the laughs because everybody's just laughing so hard. Right. And I can see that you're going, wait for it. Wait for it because yep. it doesn't die down. Because if you can step on the laughs, you yeah, know, like uh-huh. you can, and I can see. I, I was so fascinated with that clip because I was like, I can, I know exactly what's happening. Yeah, you're going, no, don't say it yet, don't respond because this guy he's doing this bit and this guy yells this hysterical thing from the crowd. And it's not, and it's not heckling. He's just literally like, it's kind of a joke from the crowd mm-hmm. to respond it's to what just he's trying saying. Trying to help out, yeah, yeah, and it's hysterical and it just kills. Like, uh-huh. and it was so cool to see you kind of not just start going. Yeah, we're going. No, oh, this is a like. This it's happening. Like, I sat in it and let him yeah, do the thing, and then I, I repeated what he said because not everyone in the room. And can, then it got even more it. laughs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you just kind of stood there, and then I just gave him credit for it. Yeah, and it's but but what's so impressive is that's not your bit. You just had no. to real time. Yeah, feel the room. Yeah, you're following where the laughter is. Like you're not stand, you're not stepping on jokes. <laughs> it's just so interesting. Like that was that was my favorite thing about that tour was going, man. Two hundred people in Portland. Speed of my set was Mach 7. Uh. I mean, it, you know, because it's like, ah, and then they're done. Then you're off. Yeah. And then, God, the rhyming, it was like, I, I remember I did my first couple of jokes, and I would pace because mm-hmm. I didn't know what else to do. Mm-hmm. You know, because it'd be like, da-da-da, ah, clap, clap. And I'm, mm-hmm. I mean, it'd be like one Mississippi, two Mississippi, two, okay, nodding, three Mississippi, <laughs> <laughs> four Mississippi. And it, you know, it throws your thing off. Yeah. Like you really have to, you know. Is that a musician thing you think that you're counting? Well, I just, I, I I was trying to figure out like what the, yeah. you know, just the beats mm-hmm. for the whole thing. Right. So I, I imagine again, like you're in a season where you're like every night could be so different. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Where you're going, okay, with Leanne mm-hmm. or Nate, mm-hmm. you know, like, okay, I'm cutting five jokes out of, of my 30 minute set because yeah. There's going to be built in just extra seconds of people the size of the venue. There is, and it's bummer too because the crowd's so good. And I'm like, oh, oh I, I really want to tell them this one. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but yes. I got to do. I got to stick to my time. Yeah, yeah. I, I've found, and I know John's this way too. One of the coolest um, 
realizations I had in my career was doing shows with Brandy Carlisle. This is probably a decade ago. We did like, I don't know, I did like two or three weekends with her, and she is just one of the most gracious performers because she really is like, hey, when you're on stage, they are yours. Uh-huh. So like, do your thing. Yeah. And I remember talking to my manager. I was like, man, her crowd is eating up stories. Mm. Like any banter I had, they were just into it. And so it was the first time I did this. He was like, well, then let's just drop songs. And I was like, well, like I'm playing music and opening. And he was like, well, no, you're just trying to win. Like it doesn't. <laughs> so we like, you know, my six songs, we'd take two out. And then that gave me 10 minutes where I could. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it was amazing. And now that's kind of what I do now, especially in opening scenarios. Yeah. I'm like, I'll drop songs because I know like connection humor wise is so powerful, especially when we have the get out of jail free card of. If it's not working, you just jump right into a song. Yeah. Right. And I can pace that way because I think people aren't ready for laughing. So it's like you do a couple and they're kind of like, oh. And then by the third joke you make after the third song, they're like, they're ready. They're leaning in, you know. That's a great – he said, you just want to win? Is that what he yeah, said? Yeah, he was like, yeah. That's a great way just to put connect. it. Yeah. Because, yeah, whatever it is. I mean, I've started to come around to – I used to be a comedy snob, comedy purist. If anyone did anything other than straight stand up, yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah. oh, yeah. come on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But now I'm like, you know what? If the people love you, who yeah. am I to judge? Yeah. Go do what you got to do. It's really just about connection. I yeah. mean, it sounds corny, but I mean, I think that after doing this for 15, 17 years, I'm like, that's really what I need to feel is mm. like some just sort of we're like. Together. Yeah, we're all together in this moment connected. Mm-hmm. And that can happen through song or it can happen through comedy or can happen through whatever you know yeah absolutely so if the people enjoy it who am i to yeah. say that's not how you should be doing things right. yeah as long as you're not stealing material then go do what you gotta do yeah, yeah, yeah. right you are a new dad yeah you're, you're a new husband too yeah yeah has this what has that been like and wh- has it been <laughs> like just a, a a new well of material it's the only reason i did it yeah <laughs> yeah the only reason i to did be it. on dadville and <laughs> well, tax right off your career yeah, the three on that bill. But I was like, <laughs> I'm out of material. I can't do any more being single in my 40s joke. So I'm like, oh, I know. I'll get married. I'll get married. Yeah. I'll give me a yeah. whole new set. And then when that was running dry, I was like, let's have a kid. Baby, let's, yeah, let's yeah. Get a no, kid what's in. the next thing? Good question. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll become a monk or something. I don't know. <laughs> Just reverse the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Just throw it, torch it all. I'll, I'll change my gender. <laughs> <laughs> that is the next thing. That yeah. is. Yeah. Right. Let's uh, not get ahead of ourselves. Um, it it's been great, and I did. In all seriousness, most so much of my material when I was single was about being single at my yeah. age, and just a lot of. I've always been really into self deprecation, uh-huh. and when you first start off, um, you know, there's a fine line between being self deprecating and sad, mm-hmm. right? And right. sometimes I would dip too far in the sad, and, yeah. And either my friends or sometimes <laughs> strangers would say, "Hey." Um, we kind of felt sorry for you more than laughing yeah, with you. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And then over time I got where I could, this is not even what you asked, but I just thought about, you get to master it a little bit better where you can, you're still making fun of yourself, but we're all in this joke yeah, together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That right, kind of right. experience. I used to have all jokes about being single. And then when I got married, obviously that quickly changed. And I have so much material about, I got married right before the pandemic hit. So we got thrown oh, into the I've fire. I've heard this bit you do. Um, yeah, this is so good. I mean, so it's just, <laughs> so now like I had a, I did, um, I got to do the Grand Ole Opry and some friends came and one of them said, and I took this as a compliment. He said, I don't know what Brian did for material before he got married. And I was thinking, you used wow. to say that about me being single. Wow. Yeah. 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 So that just shows if you can write, you can write. Right. Yeah. So now I've got a baby who's eight months old. So now I'm mm. developing material about my, my child yeah. and, and. You know, what well, do you do? You feel like when we were talking about your career, where you know you change into comedy, but you kind of go in informed, right? You're not 21 doing it; you're 35, right? Doing it. D- does that? Well, that's tra- what I started. Yeah, yeah. Does it translate into? Do you feel that way about marriage and and having your child doing it a little later in life? Like, do you feel like you're coming in a little more? That's my angle for yeah, sure. Yeah, kind of poised sure. or just you know you know yourself. You're but right. I can see that going the other way. Like, <laughs> oh man, you're, so badly. You are set in your ways over here, and then you uh, are really disrupting the like, train that's been running you're like for a Burger while. Burger King Tuesdays are totally <laughs> off balance now. You know what I mean? <laughs> Whopper Wednesday, oh, yeah. non-negotiable. <laughs> you're talking about like my personal life, and yes, yeah. well, that's for sure. Yeah, um, in comedy, it's great, but in your personal life, you know. But I think my wife and I were. We're both older, and what we lack in energy, hopefully we have in maturity. 
right. and finances as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, what, what is that? I'm, I'm so you said that so well. What is that like? Like, what, what is it like being a 50 year old dad? And I don't just mean energy, like, but what do you? When you think about people you know that have kids that are younger, I mean, I mean, even Nate or whoever mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that are in your group of friends, what are the ways that you think? Oh, that's not how I think about that, or, or you know what I mean? Like, what, what are the? I just think it's so cool you're doing that now, and I think for as much as people may go, oh, that'd probably be tough because yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm 44, and yeah. I feel like I'm, I'm infinitely more tired than I was a decade ago. Like yeah. I really feel, uh-huh. I'm like, yeah, man, I'm just trying to catch up, but. There's also things I know now that I didn't then that I think are valuable. Right. Do, what What do you think are the pluses to that? Like, what are the things as a dad and a husband now that you're like, man, doing it now is really different than probably, you know, it mm-hmm. has its benefits. Well, I'm probably more patient. Hmm. And my wife and I are probably more patient. But I still think it's almost like what we talked about earlier about how you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And I think about some of my early gigs and I'm like, why would I ever have done that? But I didn't know any better. Yeah. 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 And it's kind of that way, I think, now. Wow. I think I'll probably look back, <laughs> hopefully when I'm older, and like, how did I do that? Yeah. Because I'm getting up in the middle of the night now, and I just don't know any better. Yeah. So. Yeah, right, right. You know, so it's hard to answer that question because um, it's the only thing I know. So Do you feel, like, do you when, when you hear any of your friends talk about them and their kids, are there any things that you feel differently being older than some of them when they talk about those experiences at, at their ages? Um, that's a good question. I was trying to think of some examples. I mean, not really. The only thing is they'll share a lot of stories about spouse fighting, which is totally understandable. And you're you're on each other's nerves and stuff like that. And again, thankfully my wife and I, we, we have a pretty good balance. And, and again, we have, we're a little bit more financially stable. Um, so you know, we can yeah pay for a babysitter or, or whatever. Which I mean, I would think maybe in the you know if you're doing the Family Feud, that would probably be in those five top five six answers to that. Like you saying that is, I didn't even think yeah. about that just financially. I mean, mm-hmm. you think about starting a family, you know, traditionally in your whatever late twenties, early thirties. Mm-hmm. I mean, unless you live in Mississippi, all my friends are like nineteen. <laughs> but like you know, it's like. You are there you're you're having to do a lot of things for the first time including right. making money yeah. buying a home you know yeah. cars yeah. it's like your thing. energy level is the only thing you got yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean and just mm-hmm. joie de vivre yeah that's just it. your joie de vivre but i think it's it's interesting that you said cuz i hadn't thought about that like you are coming in one of the biggest stresses about starting a family you guys have usurped to some degree which is just financial mm-hmm. yeah. just that you aren't going like we outsource our love yeah <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Russia has a great program that we found, uh, and it works really well on Zoom. I see my daughter maybe an hour a week. Uh, you know, it's I great. Catch up. I, I pay so someone. To watch She's her. so cute. Yeah. I, I'm curious what the because um, your daughter's eight months old. Yeah. Said. So the energy level really hasn't even had to kick in yet. I mean, she's not even. Yeah, right, right, right. You know, chasing right. Her I'm around. sure when she's two or well, three. Well, but, but, but yes. the sleep thing is sleep really thing, what I think is yeah. where the energy gets the most depleted. Yeah. It just sleeping. changes, I think. Like, in the beginning, it is so intense. I mean, the first episode that we did on this podcast, I recalled, like, the first night that our oldest, Luca, was born. And I, all, night one, I was delirious with sleep deprivation. Mm-hmm. Completely one delirious. What night? Knowing that, one. knowing that you had played shows and done that 100% in your life, but yeah. in the context of holding a child, it just felt so much different. First was, night, the first night home? First night in the hospital. No, this is Okay, that was night. my, that was maybe my toughest so far. Really? Really. Because, um, I mean, our, our baby was just born in March, and we were in the hospital for a couple of, my wife had a C-section, we were in the hospital for a couple of days, and I was so emotionally drained yeah, also. Yeah, 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 yeah. It meant so much. Yeah, that's I mean, well that, But you know what I mean. And then they're coming in round the clock oh, all yeah, night yeah, long yeah. and then i was just spent yeah uh so <laughs> i kind of agree with you that was some of the toughest for me yeah well I, I forgot that that's that's very important to state it is like drill sergeant vibes where they're like every hour they're waking you up and you're kind of yeah jar and just the it everything is so heavy you're like this baby and she's still breathing. Is it okay? Mm-hmm. Going to, yes. Hey, honey, and the, oh, what? Okay, we've got to feed, and then the feeding is working or not working. Mm-hmm. It's it's a it's a very it, it, the, um, everything is just at like ten. Yes, you yeah. know, absolutely. Yeah. So it's not a normal night where you're not sleeping well. It's like right, you know. And I remember the first. We have two daughters, so both times there was like you like you enter into the the fog, and then 
with both times, there was like the first night that you got like four hours in a row of mm-hmm. sleep. Like the baby slept for four hours. Mm-hmm. And you and you have that moment where you feel like you have come back to humanity. Mm-hmm. Where you're like, okay, everything's going to be okay. All the stuff that I was, I thought that our life was spiraling out of control for right. a couple weeks there. We're going to be okay. Yeah. It was sleep deprivation. Yeah. Did you guys have anything like that? What was the coming Abs- home like? Uh, yeah, it was tough. And, and um, I was just thinking this today. It's obviously gotten better in the sense we've gotten a routine and we know our daughter and, mm-hmm. and all that. But it's also getting harder because it's been eight months down to sit in. This kid's not leaving. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> anything else in my life, I'm used to like, just tough it out. <laughs> You got a bad roommate or something, you know, their lease is up in March just, yeah, yeah. and then just tough it out. This kid will not leave. Yeah. yeah. She's still there. And I think it's sinking in for my wife and I both like, oh yeah, this isn't, cause at first you want to be Superman and like, I'll do whatever. Right. Right. And then after six months or whatever, you're like, oh, I can't do this forever. Yeah. <laughs> She's not going somewhere. You know? She's still here. She's still here. She yeah. will not leave. I thought she'd be <laughs> out here by now. I can't do this forever. I don't think, <laughs> honey, just a heads up. I don't think I can do this <laughs> And my wife does. I tell people 90% of the work, truthfully more like 95% of the yeah. work. Oh, yeah. uh-huh. But still, it's just, it's, it's a lot. And people tell me, and you guys tell me if this is true, they were like, as soon as you figure out one phase, well, they're oh, moving yeah, into yeah, another yeah. phase, and you yes. got to start all over. Yeah, 100%. And, you, they, and then you don't even remember some of the things. Like, you'll be looking through pictures or something, and you'll be like, oh, my gosh, I forgot. I'm already we, doing that. We were obsessed. Like, we thought that our life was going to be nothing but this phase forever. And I, I've even forgotten that phase. Yeah. I'm it's already crazy. doing that. My baby's eight months old and swaddling. Like when we first yeah. brought her home, the swaddle was oh, so yeah, important. Yeah. Yes. And we're trying to get that down. And now, you know, I'm like, oh, yeah. We used to you try know, to do that. That reminds me of, do you remember with, it must have been with Livy, where I, I thought with Luca, I was like the swaddle ninja. I was <laughs> so good with the, the rap. Mm-hmm. And then we had Livy here. And I would do the thing, and she, like uh, like an Olympian, would get out of mm-hmm. yeah. any. I would do it as tight as possible, like double swaddle. She would get out of it, and then we came over, and you were like, there's a thing. Do you remember this? Do I know? We, I mean, we were evangelists for that thing. You were. It was a thing. I uh, forget the It's probably name, illegal okay. now. Oh, but it's, it was no, like, we got it from Taiwan. I mean, it was definitely. <laughs> it was like this, this like straight jacket swaddle for sack? babies. Well, no, we had those two, which are awesome. Yeah. But it had like two, it had like a strap that you put under their arms and <laughs> oh, then totally you strapped <laughs> over their arms. So literally imagine, <laughs> sorry, I keep stepping on that. Imagine like, you know, you have the swaddle, like it's, it's laid out, you yeah. know, and your baby's on it. Well, inside of that, there were little flaps that went over each, over each arm and under their body. So it tucked them into their body and then you swaddled them. Oh, wow. And they slept I mean, it like literally babies. is, is well, a nightmare. <laughs> Touche. Yeah. But, it, but yeah, I mean, but but you know, they they say like the first three months out of the womb, you're trying to recreate. It's like the fourth trimester. Yeah, yeah. They they want to feel like they're still in the womb, and then you know you like you have you see they kind of like oh I'm I, I can I'm good. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. But for that, it's like the tighter and more compact they are, the more comfortable they are. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you would just feel like oh the police are going to break down the door any because you know like you're. You're getting them to where they can't move. Yeah. But then they yeah. are they sleep so hard. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, but yeah, John, we I mean Annie Annie should have gotten paid. My wife should have gotten paid by that company because she, she would she would she the way that she would do it, the same way that we were give like somebody just she would just leave it on people's front doorsteps and it'd just be like, hey, I know you had said I had time. just try this and then people would call it. Uh, thank you so much. I love you so much. We <laughs> slept last night through the night. Our child is fourteen <laughs> years old, and we slept. So, um, but it's you know you need to have a show called Future Dadville <laughs> so we can learn this stuff yes. before it's too late. Yes, that's right. That's right. That's true. So do you think that's y'all do y'all want to have more kids? If y'all talked about that, or is it? Um, it, we've talked about it a little bit. We really need to have a. I mean, we're we're so old now that <laughs> <laughs> that <laughs> it's getting ridiculous. Um. But we did um, – so we didn't – let me share a little bit if I have time to yeah, kind, yeah, of, kind of our journey. We um, we were too old to have kids naturally, so we were looking at IVF. We were going to the National Fertility Clinic. And, wow. And this is all during COVID, so it was really, really wow. hard because we were wow. also looking at adoption. And, you know, all, most of that stuff just stopped. Yeah. 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 Bringing home kids from China, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. So we're on this waiting list. We're on a bunch of waiting lists for everything, but – they asked us, would you ever considered, um, this is the fertility clinic, adopting the embryo? 
And we were like, oh, what is that? And they said, well, a lot of families, they make multiple embryos because often, you know, it doesn't work the first time. And then if they have successful pregnancies, then they have these leftover embryos and they feel like they're alive and they don't want them destroyed. So they're sitting in a freezer. So they want to give them to someone. And Holy we said, cow. yeah, well, we'd like to be on that waiting list. And then they called us one day and said, there's this family. They've had two little boys. They have these extra embryos and they want to donate them to a Christian family. Oh my gosh. Would you guys be interested in meeting with them? And we said, yes. And this is during COVID. So we met with them over zoom and we kind of interviewing each other. I guess they were interviewing us more than them, but kind of both with each other. And then there was another family that they also gave embryos to. So we met with that family. So the bottom line is we accepted the embryo. And um, so my daughter has two full-blooded siblings from that family. Oh, wow. And a sister who's three months older than she is from this other family. No way. Wow. And, um, so it's pretty crazy. And now, and, and to clarify, none of us, even the family who donated, it's not their biological kids either because they picked out an embryo, uh, a sperm and a, um, egg from a catalog and had it made. So it's not like any of the kids look like any of these parents. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's very yeah. unusual. So my, my daughter has full blooded siblings, um, from two different families. Holy cow. And I say all that to say we do have one more embryo that wow. we were going to have to choose. We're going to have to decide. Uh, yeah, I've never yeah. even shared that with anybody. But, yeah. but did your your wife carry it so she was surrogate for she, the egg? She did. She carried wow. it. Wow. Yep. And uh, wow. When we went in for the transplant, the the it was so the embryo was so small, it was they had to look at it under a microscope, and they implanted the embryo. It was been frozen for like two years. Good they implanted the embryo, and then they went back to the warmer place where they had it and had looked through a microscope just to make sure it wasn't still it was so small they weren't even sure if they implanted it correctly and you're like and then you got a baby boy we spent a lot of money on something they're not even sure if it's in there but that is like science fiction you know that is crazy i know it's crazy amazing it's crazy and then uh now i'm really deep diving here um we go in for our first was it our first First or second checkup just to see how everything's going. And this was one embryo that they implanted, and they said, it is split, and you have two. You have twins. Holy cow. So for about <clears throat> two months, maybe, if it, I don't know if it was that long, we were carrying twins. Wow. And, and we shared with our families um, that when we finally decided to tell them, we're like, we're having twins, and everyone was freaking out. And then, unfortunately, right after that, we lost one of oh, them. Yeah. Mm. But... Um, but you know, thankfully, Holy our daughter cow. is very healthy and and she's doing great. So it's it's been a crazy journey and a crazy story. Well, that that deciding to do that again. I mean, we've had some friends that have done, you know, all the versions yeah. of those things. Yeah, um, never that. But but like, um, that's fascinating. By yeah. the way, fascinating. Yeah. I don't think I've ever heard of that that exact that scenario. Exact thing. Before. Yeah. But it, but it is it is it's such a decision. It's like it, yeah. it almost feels like more of a decision than just someone that has a baby naturally because it's mm-hmm. like. Not naturally, because y'all had it nat- But you know what I'm saying? We're yes, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah, I know what you mean. And so, because, you know, you just sort of, there's just so much that you're, d- you're taking on mentally, emotionally. Yeah. You know, it's just, a, it's such a, it's a big deal. Yeah. You know? It is. And so when you're deciding to do it, it's not quite like, like, hey, do we want to maybe try to get pregnant again and do that thing? It's right. like, you know, and, it, and, and to the point, even just sitting with people talking that are, a fi- just that. Yes. Like, you don't do that when you have your kid with you and your spouse. Right, you know what right, I mean? You're not right. sitting with all these people doing interviews and Zoom. Co- you know what I mean? It's, it's just yeah. such an interesting thing to add on to what's sort of been this process throughout yeah. the world. And then now it's like, it looks like that sometimes. So it's, yeah. it's not, it's a little more, I'm imagining exhausting, you know. It's, than, it's mentally draining for yeah, sure. Yeah. It's yeah. a lot of stress. And just and doubly invested almost. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So and it wouldn't it, be something it, to do. And if we choose not to, then we're going to want to give this embryo mm-hmm. to, to mm-hmm. a, needy family because wow. we're not going to want to destroy it either yeah right yeah. right that's amazing that's yeah. so unique man. what a cool story yeah, yeah. that yeah. is incredible as you're ta- as you're talking about all this i'm thinking have you been workshopping some sort of like this is complex <laughs> but there's got to be a bit in here mm-hmm. i have now obviously <laughs> um i haven't shared it on stage which i don't know what the difference between that is in a podcast but you know there's these other families I want to be uh, 
uh, yeah, respectful yeah. Yeah, to, that's right. to them yeah. and, and their ch- And we've all said that we're going to share with uh, our kids mm. the process early and often. And, and we're going to, we've all met up once. We've all got together oh, wow. once. Wow. But obviously the kids are so small, yeah, yeah, they don't yeah. know anything. Yeah. But we want to keep this going, and mm-hmm. we want them to know about Man. each other. Yeah. But um, as far as working into a material, I just have to figure out a way to do it and be respectful and not divulge, you know. Of course, I'm not going to give out their uh, right. address. <laughs> right. Isn't that one of the things, I mean, we don't have to loop back totally into this, but that is another part that we've we've talked about before. You know, we were talking about with having you on, it's like, you know, you, you, you do a job. Well, like, if I write a song about my wife, that's sweet. Mm-hmm. Like if you do material in your wife, that can be very touch and go. <laughs> it's not going to be sweet. It's not going to be sweet. So it's like, you know, that is another part. Like you saying, you got to sort of make sure yeah. that's another sort of casualty or whatever of, of a comic's life is that, you yeah. know, everything is subject material. Well, and, and there's also that, that, uh, that other famous line. I don't know who said it, but if you're not, if your friends aren't uncomfortable, then you're not really writing, mm. you know? Yeah. Which I think is more about like, uh, um, was pointed more toward like, uh, movies or books or whatever something like that but i'm sure it would be probably the, the same, same as comedy yeah, yeah um my wife is super cool about all this stuff and she gets it she mm. gets comedy and she often points out to people really because people say oh he's kind of hard on you if you listen to the joke i'm more making fun of myself yeah, yeah. than her yeah. and she gets that um and i tell some jokes like again with leah morgan the 90 percent of the audience is women yeah and when I tell some jokes about my wife, there's some groans, <laughs> some laughs and some groans, but I make fun of myself more than anyone. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of important to do that off the top to show people yeah, yeah, I can yeah, make yeah, fun yeah, of myself yeah, yeah. before I start making yeah, fun right, of other right, people. Right, 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 right. It's like that, I think about it like, uh, th- this blew my mind when I learned this first time, but that idea that when you're screenwriting the Save the Cat, you know that idea of like, which is crazy when you learn this, how much this is done in movies, but the idea is... You need to see the hero of the story do something good, so you so you are connected to them. Mm. And it, you actually literally see this, which I wonder if the screenwriters did this on purpose. But uh, what was the movie? This is such a random example, but it literally happens, which has made me laugh. But it's um, Denzel and he's blind, and it's like post apocalyptic. Mm-hmm. And we're talking about oh know, yeah yeah. Um, and he's and it's a great, it's a really entertaining movie. But he literally saves a cat in the first minute. There's a kitten, and you can tell he's blind. You can tell it's you know it's that gray. Remember the whole thing is gray yeah. and sort of dark. And he there's a little cat, and he like breaks the little bit of food he has, and he gives it to him. And that's how you're sort of endeared mm-hmm. to yeah. characters. Like this, yeah. this is like a whole screen or anything in Hollywood is that you need to somehow get the mm-hmm. character on your side. Mm-hmm. But to your point, comedy's like that true too. Like you come out swinging too hard unless you are Dave Chappelle or Chris Rock, where it's like if that they, is your thing. That's right. If they know you, you can maybe do it. Yeah, yeah. but like otherwise, you, you know, you can't. You got to sort of get them on your side yeah you know for sure and i go out there and usually no one knows who i am so i have to get them on my side first yeah. before i can start swinging at other people <laughs> <laughs> this, this is good. that's a good lesson life okay so so thank you for your time sure we always ask two questions at the end okay um one um what would you like your daughter to know what's the one thing that you would like your daughter to know um adobe and photoshop <laughs> Because it's you can't overstate the. Importance the only reason we had kids is because we need help with our computer. Oh my gosh! I don't good. know what I'm doing. That's really good. So if she could help with that, that's really the reason we had her. Cut to you with like the glasses really far in your nose. Yeah. You're looking at the computer weird. Just like, give me the mouse. And you're like, well, honey, I'm just trying to get the. I don't want to get the. Just give me move. You know? I don't understand TikTok. I just oh, wanted to. Oh. I just wanted to. I help never me feel older than when I open that app. Oh, I know. Never feel older. I don't know if there's anything that I do. I mean, I wish TikTok had went the route of cryptocurrency. I just wanted it to go away because I didn't understand it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. There's so many rules. I know. I know. That's probably all right. So that's probably not the best answer. Um, We'll give you. There are no rules. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll say that. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I wanted wanted to learn some basic video editing skills (laughs) to help out her dad. (laughs) That is the first. We have not quite oh, had that. That is really good. Okay, last question. What do you want your daughter to say at your funeral? Dad was old. I knew this day was coming. <laughs> I'm all, way too young. From the all, beginning, I knew this was We coming. all saw it. I'm way we too young to be up here. <laughs> I'm eight, and my dad's 80. Uh, I should not be up here doing this. <laughs> uh, um, no, I, I, you know, the same thing as everyone would say that um, – you know, my dad loved me and that mm. he wanted to bring joy to the world through laughter. And, mm-hmm. and he was 
a good dad and uh you know i hope she says that i hope she feels that way and that um that <laughs> he loved me and i loved him back so i have to say this because usually we end here but you just said something that's so true and i think it's so beautiful and i just want to ask you one more question I, I do think that is different. I think that is a different thing than most comics. I really do. Like, I think... What do you mean? What you just said about joy to the world. Yeah. And I think... I wonder if that's something that's intrinsic to your faith or if it's just the way you feel. But it's really profound. Like, that's what I, why I don't want to skip over it before we end is because there is a difference in us getting up on stage to sort of, like, make ourselves feel better right. or to try to justify our existence in the world right. or to give some kind of meaning to our life. Comedy, I, I don't know anything more profound, maybe, than comedy in some ways. Like, the ability to make somebody laugh and what happens chemically in your body when yeah. you laugh yeah. is magic. And so it's really cool to hear you say that because I think it, that's such a different thing. That's a different calling. Uh -huh. When you feel like you're being called to bring joy, Yeah, that's a different thing than, than I'm a comic. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I do know what you mean. I really do mean that. I really, do, But at the same time, I'm as, as petty as anyone. <laughs> And I find myself, <laughs> like if I'm on one of these showcase shows, and maybe you guys feel yeah, 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 like yeah. this, especially if my set doesn't go well, yeah, I don't want anyone set to go well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So if I really wanted to bring <laughs> yeah. joy to this audience, I wouldn't care who's yeah, getting the yeah. laughs. I would just right, want them to be right. happy. Yeah. But the truth is, I want to be the no, best. I, 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 I want to yeah. bring joy as long as I'm the one doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I know, I know. But still, it's in there. It's in there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> On your better days. Yeah. Well, yeah, thanks thank for you. coming. Thank you. So yeah, great. thanks for having me. Um, I really appreciate it.